initiative, and I'm also here with Amy Royer, the uh, project coordinator. The mission of RHI is to engage partners to share ideas and expertise and to support communities in improving health while stimulating a higher level of wellness across the state. Thank you all for joining us today for the Get Them Moving webinar presented by Mary McCourt. A few technical details before we get started. All lines have been set to mute. At the end of the presentation, we will have a question and answer session. At this time, I will unmute all lines. If you wish to mute your line during the Q&A, you can do so by selecting the microphone icon in the WebEx control panel on your screen. Pressing mute on your phone will work as well. You can also submit questions in the chat box on the right side of your screen during the duration of the presentation, and they will be addressed by Mary during the Q&A session. If you type in the chat box, make sure you send your comments to all participants, otherwise comments will only be seen by me. Once the webinar is over, you will have an opportunity to provide valuable feedback for RHI through a brief survey. The survey will automatically pop up on your screen and will and we'll just take a few minutes to complete. Thank you again for joining us today, and I will now roll the ball over to Mary and she can begin her presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to be here today to chat with you about what's going on in Missoula. Okay, um, so some of you might have been on last week's call where I discussed um, how we got started on our Let's Move initiative. And I'll go over just a little review on that, but today I basically am going to talk about how we have convinced teachers to increase physical activity because it promotes learning, and we're going to show you um, what the Missoula teachers reported once they tried some of our strategies. So I just would like to review the history of Let's Move. Um, in 2007, Dr. Gaskell at the University of Montana in the Health and Human Performance Department did a study on 252 second through 12th grade students on their physical activity levels and looked at their uh, corresponding academic performance, and I'll talk more in detail on that later. And then in 2008, the Missoula City County Health Department, where I am located, uh, we started our third grade BMI surveillance project for third graders, which we continue to this day. And in that project, we discovered that about 13% of our third graders are obese. And we'll talk a little more about that. And so then in about 2009, 2010, we became a Let's Move city and county through Michelle Obama's Let's Move initiative. And then in 2012 and 2013, we had two different summits. And I'm going to talk specifically today about the results of those summits and presentations in regards to physical activity. Next week, I'm going to be talking about nutrition and some of the um, successes we've made uh, with nutrition and the, the nutrition initiative. So uh, the two presenters that I want to talk about were Dr. Mark Fenton to begin with. And um, if you ever have a chance to hear Dr. Fenton talk, let me tell you, he is a force to be uh, reckoned with. He, he is just so energetic himself, and he just believes in what he calls sticky places. And how he explained it is the stickier your community is, the more likely you are going to move. And so he, um, what he realized was that we need to increase the routine and daily physical activity for everyone. And in order to do that, we have to have schools and communities where kids and adults can be outside and being physically active. And so Dr. Fenton uh, used the, oh, and let me give you a little background. I'm sorry on Dr. Fenton. He's a transportation planning and public health consultant, uh, a PBS television host, and a pedestrian and bicycle advocate. 
And so he introduced this change uh, using the social ecology model. And so in the social ecology model, in other words, how do we get people, institutions, and communities to change, to be, in this respect, healthier? So on the, on the individual change, so there are a lot of people that will say, oh, kids are just obese because they just don't get up and move. Well, it isn't quite that simple as most of you on this call understand. But in terms of individual change, what you have to look at are skills and motivation. So skills for a child would be skills that they learn in PE class, how to jump rope, how to play dodgeball, how to run, those simple things. So you, you develop those skills in kids so that when they have the opportunity to use them, they're able to use them. And then another piece is motivation. And so recently, I'll give a personal example. I'm not a runner, but I'm a walker. And recently, I signed up to walk the half marathon in the Missoula Marathon. So now I have a motivation to uh, get, get more active than I usually am. Um, and so then there's the interpersonal world of a child. And that involves family, friends, I and mean, then adults, colleagues, and then what the social norms are. And so for a child, if a child is living, of course, in a sedentary household, that child is less likely to use the skills he or she might have learned in his or her PE class. So we, we constantly are knocking on the door of families, of course, to change health uh, in all aspects, be it tobacco, be it safe, uh, safe car, safety seats, car, child car seats. We're constantly trying to teach families, do it in your family and your child will benefit greatly. It's, that is a particularly hard mountain to climb. So then how do we change, bring about behavioral change in institutions? So the institutions that we would be looking at in terms of health in regards to obesity would be for children, schools. For adults, it would be work and health care. And for kids, it would be health care. So do you have your pediatrician talking to a parent? about physical activity and healthy nutrition? And if not, why not? And how do we change that? And then service providers. And that would be anything from WIC to any social service program that has contact with families and children. Uh, after school programs, big brothers, big sisters. How do we outreach to them so that they are taking our message of good nutrition and active play and physical activity to their settings. And then, of course, we have the community. And that is, what do we offer in our community? Do we have safe streets? Do we have lit streets? Do we have sidewalks? Do we have parks nearby? Um, do we have networks where people, for instance, in Missoula, uh, one of our big community programs that we have is the Active Six program, where all sixth graders in Missoula County have a free membership to the YMCA for the whole school year. And so that's a, that's a network of folks that have put money into that program. And so we offer that to our kids. So that's that partnership. How do we do that partnership? And then public policy. So, so where are the ordinances in city government that decide how a new building project is built? Do they have to have green space? Do they have to have sidewalks? Do they have to think about how kids can be outside in those new developments? Um, permitting practices, procedures, laws, those types of things are really the ultimate change in how we bring about community change. And so Dr. Fenton talked about which socio-ecological successes we've seen. And so tobacco, I used to work here at the Health Department in tobacco control. And tobacco is really kind of, I believe, our best model. And when we're looking at 
childhood obesity prevention. Because tobacco, uh, changing tobacco, the use of tobacco, started in 1952 with the first Surgeon General's report. So that was the education piece. And then they started cutting back on how tobacco products could be advertised to children. Okay? Then they added taxes to tobacco to increase um, how much that product would cost because they knew that cost determines people's behavior. So we had education, cutting back on marketing to children, taxes, and then they looked at secondhand smoke policies and bans. So it became um, expensive. It became against the social norm. It used to be that smoking was part of the social norm. Uh, you can't smoke now. At work, you used to be able to, when I started working as a social worker decades ago, I, could, I did and could smoke at my desk. Uh, thankfully, I was never an everyday tobacco smoker, but those sorts of things have changed how we look at tobacco and how we use tobacco. So the tobacco usage rate in the 50s was at about, for men, was about 50% in Montana. Currently, it's anywhere from 18 to 20%. And that's how that all worked, working on the education, the policies, the taxes, and the bans. It would be great if we could tax, uh, in some places, do tax soda, but all of those things we're learning from tobacco. Seat belts and child safety restraints are another example where it started out with media. You should be wearing your seat belt. Here it looks what happens when you don't wear your seat belt. And then training, especially training for how to put in child safety restraints properly in your car. And then laws and then enforcement of those laws. And water and sewer uh, is similar socio-ecological successes. So that was Dr. Fenton's um, introduction to how we should be thinking about this issue. And then our second presenter at, the, uh, at both the 2012 and the 2013 uh, summits was Dr. Darla Castelli from the University of Texas, Austin. And Dr. Castelli studies the effects of physical activity on motor and cognitive performance in school-aged children and emerging adults. I love that term, emerging adults. Um, and she's interested in the relationship between metabolic risk factors and cognition and how physical activity can reverse its effects. And I have to say that of of anyone who we were able to bring to Missoula, Dr. Castelli has really had the greatest impact, especially in our school district. So her presentation had to do with cognitive and brain health, moving from known relationships to cause and effect results. So this causes this, and this is the effect if you add this. And she asked the question, if it's medicine, what's the dose? So start thinking about exercise as, as a medicine and points of intervention in children's health. So those were the main things that Dr. Castelli uh, outlined. And this is what she showed the, our, our audience. And so it's really interesting because we're talking about fit children and sedentary children fit adults and sedentary adults. And what you can see, the red and the yellow is brain activation. So the difference between a child that is fit, that is meeting the guidelines for fitness according to the CDC, compared to the sedentary children that are not meeting it, look at the difference in, that, in those brain activities. And these are actual images from children. And if you look at the difference, though, between fit adults and sedentary adults, it's very interesting. So I can sit and watch my favorite TV show and still do my crossword, and I should be okay as far as how I, my neuroactivation. So this is a little more of an example of higher fit children 
versus lower fit children. And I have to say to you that when people in the, the Missoula uh, County Public School uh, administration saw these slides, this made a lot of sense to them. And Dr. Gaskell is a, is a, a colleague of Dr. Um, Castelli and was the one that Dr. Gaskell suggested we bring Castelli in because he knew that this, this was going to be what would open the door for our work in the school. I had been knocking on the door with my BMI studies saying children are, children are chubby, they're overweight, they're obese, let's do something about it. And it wasn't that the schools were uninterested, but let's face it, what we, what we ask our schools to do is to educate our children. And they, they don't want obese children, but they don't see that as their primary goal in, in their role in the community. And yet this, this is their primary role, is how do we get kids to be better students as they're sitting in their classrooms. And so I want to talk about the different types of measurements that Dr. Castelli and her, and her cohorts did, or her colleagues did. They did the stimulus response test, so press the button when you see the cat, and then the discrimination task, which of uh, these symbols is, are the, so this represents this, standalone. And then this is the congruent, non-congruent task, and I've done this online a couple of times, and it's really, I find it to be a really interesting task. So you're either told to, to uh, pair the colors, so green, these two would be paired together, and these two would be paired, to, so the blue would be paired with the, the word green, but it's in blue, and the red would be paired with the word blue, but it's in red, or you're told to pair the words. So then you would be green, green, even though the colors don't match, red, red, blue, no, I'm sorry. Yes, green, green, blue, blue. There we go. <laughs> this test is really hard for me. I don't think like this, but whatever. So here's what they found out with these cognitive tests, and this is executive function. They found that reaction time, which is very important when children are learning, reaction time for high-fit adults and low-fit adults was about the same. Reaction time for high-fit children was much quicker than for low-fit children. Now, the accuracy, accuracy for high-fit adults was higher than low-fit, but the accuracy for high-fit children was so much higher than for low-fit children. And so this type of data makes sense to teachers and administrators. They understand that this is what they want to see. They want to see kids that are accurate and kids that can react well, that can learn easier and quicker is basically what it is. <clears throat> and so that there's a FIT program, and this is interesting because the FIT program was a program that Dr. Castelli ran in Texas. 50 kids, 25 of them participated in a nine-month physical activity after school program, and 25 went home after school. And those that participated in the after school program engaged in 75 minutes of physical activity each day. And those who had participated in the program improved their performance. As you can, you can see the difference. This is the pretest, and this is nine months later. And what's interesting is the kids that went home, they actually decreased. So while they were on the wait list, they basically did less than what they were doing. So what, after these two summits, what did we take on as Let's Move Missoula? Well, in regards to physical activity and the school day, we took on our goal that every student will have access to 60 minutes of physical activity a day. That is excluding their PE time because we know that kids aren't getting much time in PE. Um, 
and we we very supportive of our PE instructors, and we wish they had PE every day, but they don't. So how would we do it excluding PE? So active transportation, that would be walking or biking to school. An active before school activity, that would be a, basically an active recess from the time the kid hits the playground until the bell rings. Active brain breaks during instructional time. Active recess with a supervised activity on the playground with soft equipment. And active after school activity. All agencies using the schools will begin programs with an activity. So in our school district, we have the flagship program, which is an after school program. We have a campfire that comes into the school and offers uh, a variety of programs. And we have Big Brothers and Big Sisters that comes into the school. So, what, And we are not, we have not filled all of these, believe me. We, this is our framework. But I will share with you where we're at with this framework. So active transportation. So we updated and linked uh, our, we made new maps with the help of our uh, one of the folks that works at the city in uh, the bike and walk division. And we updated all Safe Route to School maps. And then we put those maps on the school district's um, websites. We had, each child went home with the map, and then each child can act, each parent can access it on site. So. I want to show you Russell School map. OK. So here's the school. This is Russell School right here. This is the safe route to Russell School in the neon uh, green. This red line here represents a, uh, sorry. A 15-minute walk or a five-minute bike ride to the school. And then this dotted red line for kids that live in this area represents a 25-minute walk or, I have to use the reference again, I'm sorry. I think it's a 25-minute walk or a 10-minute bike ride. So one of the reasons we did that is because culturally, we know that um, culturally, we know that parents and children overestimate how long it takes to get anywhere. Kids are used to being driven or bused to school, and we are trying to change that particular uh, culture. So we have all of those new Safe Routes to School maps up on uh, the website. What we don't have going yet, and what we hope to have soon is a more invigorated uh, Safe Route to School program at each of the schools. The funding was cut. And so we're going to have to think of a new way to partner with folks to, to have walking school buses, uh, have the mayor walk with some schools, all those things. So the zero hour active recess, this is zero hour in the morning, the, the before school. Um, in three of our poorest neighborhoods, we now have a morning move program where we have soft equipment out on the playground and volunteers where kids come, either parents drive them, they walk, or they get off the bus, and they have anywhere from 30 to 20 minutes to 10 minutes on the playground being active with volunteers and playground equipment. And we're hoping, uh, we'll talk a little more about this program later. So, when we, when we were, okay, so we have the active transportation to school, and once the kids get there, they have an active recess. And then the next piece is what we call our brain break training. And our brain break training, um, using the information on the, how the, the brain looks, we convinced our schools to allow us to come in and train teachers on how to get kids up and moving during instructional time. And so I'm going to share with you our actual training that we do. With, and this took anywhere from 30 to 40 minutes. So um, 
we start off by telling teachers that it increases the production of neurochemicals that actually have, promote brain cell repair, improves memory, lengthens attention span, boosts decision-making skills, promotes new growth in the uh, nerve cells and blood vessels, and improves multitasking and planning. And all of those things are what teachers need kids to be able to do when they're sitting in their desk. So we showed them uh, the brain, and a lot of the teachers were unable to come to the summit. So this is their introduction to how these brains light up. And this is, so what this is, it, one of the things that Darla Castelli talked about is, so do you need fit children? In other words, do you need kids that get 60 minutes a day in order to get um, their brains to light up? Or can you do it on, on, in smaller components? So this is after sitting, the brain on the left is after sitting quietly taking a test, and this is after a 20-minute walk. 18% higher score on the test that these kids took. And so we said, and this is a walk. This wasn't even a, a vigorous activity. So the research shows that anywhere from 18 to 35% higher scores on things with this activation. And so we ask children, we ask teachers, how many of you don't want your, your kids to be performing at this level? They all want their kids to be performing. We shared this. And then Dr. Gaskell in his 2007-8 study, he looked at uh, these kids that he studied, and he looked at how many of them are getting their 60 minutes. So you can see that second graders, third graders, fourth graders, fifth, sixth, seventh, you can see how it decreases, okay? These, these kids here, they are very, they love to move. You can just go out on a playground and watch them. They, their bodies love to move. So what about the grade point averages? What's the difference? So what Dr. Gaskell took, he took the kids, the, the quarter of the kids with the lowest physical activity, and then he took the quarter of the kids with the highest physical activity, and he correlated their grade points. Now you can see that in grade six it was not st statistically significant, and, it, and neither was it in the elementary grades. But you can see how it starts to really change, and by 12th grade, the fit kids are at about a 3.6 or 7. And the, the, the kids, the lowest fit kids, lowest physically active kids, are at about a 2.5. That is a huge difference for kids. And so when we talk to the school district and we have the Graduation Matters Missoula Initiative, so what kids are more likely to drop out? The kids that are just with these sorts of grades are more likely. We know this. So that's another way we talk to our schools. Then we look at standardized test scores on the criterion reference test, which I'm sorry to say I don't really know what that is, but you can see in grade three it's not statistically different. But let's look at how even by grade five you see a major difference. Grade six, seven, eight, look at the difference here in grade ten. So having that Local data really was eye-opening to our teachers and our administrators. So here's the prescription that Dr. Gaskell uh, suggested we give to teachers. Before school, any physical activity is good. Walking to school, having a playground break. Regular throughout the day, five minutes every half hour. So Dr. Gaskell believes you get kids up five minutes every half hour. Never withhold physical activity, uh, even for recess, and, and use it as a punishment. And have an active recess. What Dr. Gaskell shared was a study that showed that if teachers say to kids before they go outside, they give them an assignment, okay, you're going to recess, I want you to be active during recess, that's your assignment, that that actually makes a difference for kids and require activity before counseling. I think this is very uh, 
important and start class with physical activity. Then we gave them, um, we gave them our, our contact information. So how did we measure our success? So we trained over 500 teachers uh, in Missoula County with this model. And we provided each school with a curriculum of Take 10. So what Take 10 is, is a curriculum. So we provided each school and each grade with a, with a grade-specific curriculum on how you can teach math, uh, language arts, social studies, using physical activity. So it could be prepositions. It could be multiplication tables. We provided them with that information. Uh, and I give, I, I'm giving you that, that uh, contact if you're interested. Um, the training took about 30 to 45, that should say minutes, sorry. And then we did a survey last spring with the teachers to see how they were using the information, if they were using it, how often were they using it, and what did they find. So. Uh, we did the, the uh, survey with, um, I think, 320 teachers and what, oh, 350, um, and we did 17, 16 of the 17 schools. We trained 16 of the 17 schools in the NCPS district, and here's what we found out. We found out that 78% of them reported improved attention during classroom activities. We found out that 70% of them reported improved behavior. These are the things we basically promised them. And we found out that 64% of them reported improved learning. However, the teachers who used four plus brain breaks during the day, they reported 98 on attention, 96 on behavior, and 97 on improved learning. So we were. I have to say we were pretty surprised at these results. These are pretty significant results. Um, and it, it, these results have allowed us to continue our conversation. Some of the other results, 83% of the teachers reported using increased physical activity uh, since the incorporation of the program in the past two years. And 90% of them who attended training sessions said yes, they've they've increased physical activity. And 62% who did not attend the training said they used, that they increased physical activity. So the training is important. So we do know where our challenge is, is with the middle school teachers. We also trained high school teachers, but we didn't do surveys with them because, in all honesty, we don't have a good model yet for high school. So what is our current physical, acti ac uh, physical activity successes in plans? So we're concentrating on the four schools in our poorest neighborhoods because we know that they have the highest obesity rates. We know they can't pay to play, that if they don't get their physical activity during the school day, these kids are not going to get it. Uh, so all, all of these schools have new safe route to school maps. Three of the four schools have morning move. Uh, so they have the active recess in the morning. Now it's two times a week, and soon it will be three times a week. Two schools have recess, active recess. And that when I'm talking about these programs, I'm talking that they have volunteers and equipment for these programs. So they have hula hoops, jump ropes, balls, scoopers, sleds. You know, we've. I'll, chat a little bit about that. And we're going to be increasing that to three times. All schools have been offered the Brain Break Refresher. And um, we received a Robert Woods Johnson Foundation grant, Invest in Health. And we are really zeroing in on these three neighbor neighborhoods for improvement. And I want to take you um, to our mapping device because I just have to say that for a long time, we knew that, first of all, poverty in Montana hides. But it really doesn't hide that much. We can find it. We just have to spend money to find it. So now we're going to go up here, and I'm going to put in where all the schools are in our community. 
Then I'm going to look at the health status, and I'm going to show you the percentage of where. <clears throat> okay, so the in in the city limits, the schools that aren't that the north, not the north, the rest of the city, childhood obesity rates are 10 percent, but in the in the Lowell School District in the Hawthorne School District and in the Franklin School District, obesity rates for children is 16%. And that is not a 6% difference. So here's how I explain it. Of all the kids that are obese in the Missoula schools in, inside the city, 60% of them go to these three schools, 60% of them. The other 40% go to the other school. So that helps us really look at this is where these kids that are much more obese live. So let's take that off and let's look at where poverty lives in Missoula. Okay, we're going to go with poverty, one adult and ch with a child. Okay, so you can see, once again, the same school districts have the most dense uh, level of poverty. Okay, so that helps us zero in on where um, where we should be concentrating. And so, and this is the deep poverty. This is, this is where the really, really poor people live. And yet again, they live in these areas. Now, if you were to ask the normal Missoula person downtown, where do the poor people in Missoula live? They might say, well, I don't really know, probably in the north side. Well, it's a little more, it's a little more, much more than that, actually. And so the Robert Woods Johnson uh, grant is zeroing in the Invest Health. We're, we're zeroing in on these three neighborhoods, and we're looking at sidewalks, we're looking at parks, we're looking at safety to try to improve some of those. But these are the schools: Lowell, Hawthorne, and Franklin that we're zeroing in on with our efforts. Okay. So, what's next here? Um, one of the things I want to say to folks out there is there really is no need to reinvent anything that we've done. I feel strongly that you can take our BMI data and you can take it to city leaders and you can take it to school districts and you can call it Montana obesity rates. If, if that's the rate in Missoula, it is more, more, most likely the rate across the board in Montana. It might be higher in some areas, um, but at least you can say this is Montana data and we'd be happy to share that with you. As far as our training tools, we're happy to share that with you. Our surveys, we're happy to share that with you. Um, we, I mean, those of us that live in Montana, raised in Montana, we want Montana to be a healthy state, and so don't hesitate to contact me for information about anything that I've presented. Next week, I'll be presenting what we're doing in nutrition, and I'll show you a presentation we just finished for teachers on sugar on the brain to help uh, teachers realize that having Hershey bars as training tools and having celebrations with frosted cupcakes is really not the best way to go. So at this point, Amy um, or Rachel, I'm ready for questions if there's any. Okay, I'll go ahead and unmute everyone. So um, if you want to be muted, you can do so on the WebEx control panel or on your phone as well. Everyone's unmuted, so you can go ahead and ask questions if you have any for Mary. I have a question in the chat box. Okay. Um, it says, throughout your process, have you used any YRBS data from schools or country level, 
or county level YRBS data? Well, you know, we the Y since the YRBS is self report, um, we have not used that data very much. We we've just been fortunate because of Dr. Gaskell to actually use hard data for his study. He did not use YRBS. I should have explained this. He used accelerometers, and so he actually tracked the number of moderate to vigorous minutes that those kids did over a period of five to seven days. So, um, you know, the, the self-report data I think is useful, but I'm not sure that it's, it's actually useful for body weight and nutrition and physical activity. And so there again, um, using our data, um, you can always say this is Missoula data on physical activity and academic achievement. I think that that's just a little more reliable because it actually um, was accelerometer tested, if that makes sense. Did that answer, Amy uh, or Rachel, did that, do you think that answered the question? Yeah, I think so. Okay, thanks. And I think that that's another reason why we started our BMI surveillance project. And I'll just go into that for maybe some of you that weren't on the call last week. So the surveillance is not a screening. We don't use BMI for screening. And that's how we sold it to the school. So in other words, no one knows any particular weight or height or BMI of a particular child. The child doesn't know, the P we do it during PE time. The PE teacher doesn't know, the principal doesn't know, and the parent doesn't know. The parent has the option to opt out for the BMIs, um, and we do have some opt out because they either don't, they worry about their child being weighed and measured or they're worried about what we do with the data. So we leave the school with no names, just all the measurements, and the CDC BMI, um, they have a great program where you just put the height and weight in and they calculate the BMI for you and graph it for you. So we leave the school without any identifying information and it really is very innocuous. And if a child, let's say, say the parent hasn't opted out but a child is approaching the weigh, weigh and height station, I always say, and they look nervous, I always say, you know, you don't have to do this. You can just go right back to gym class. Because we weigh and measure anywhere from five to 700 students a year. So we don't need to weigh and measure every child. Do we have any more questions for Mary? Mary, do you have anything else to add before we wrap up the presentation? No, um, the, I guess the only thing I would add is in our CHIP plan, um, there is a little more specific stuff. And if people are writing their CHIP and want more information about how uh, physical activity addresses the CHIP objective of reducing childhood obesity, they certainly can contact me. I'd be happy to share that with them. Okay, thank you everyone for listening to our presentation today. And again, once the webinar is over, there is a survey for you to take just for our feedback. Thank you again, Mary. Thank you.